like your guests um, had to have a different experience. Um, and uh, those of you who actually had um, a special experience will go deeper. So, I'm going to read from Luke chapter 1. And once again, we're going to read four times, right? The first time. And once again, you don't have to memorize this because, or you don't even have to take notes because I'm going to remind you at the step of the way. Uh, we're going to start with inhaling and ex exhaling, remember, in the last session. And uh, we're going to um, ask ourselves some of the questions to uh, check our condition, check where we are. And, um, and then I'm going to read the passage for four times. The first time, uh, you're going to uh, let the word just wash over you. I know it sounds kind of abstract. Like, what do you mean by that? That sounds so strange. No, just word is a substance, you know, uh, the word of God. Although it's written and I'm reading it for you and you, you hear my, my voice, my sound. But you know what? Um, the word of God has a substance. Our word has a substance. Do, do you know that? So um, do you know that it's scientifically proven? It can be proven that uh, when you say something, your body responds, your cells you know, your being responds to your words, so make sure that you say good words, even to others and to yourselves. Uh, when you're uh, talking, you know, by yourself too, and uh, your body is hearing, your brain is responding. Well, not only that, once you say something, it remains in the air, in the, in the universe. You know that. My sound, what I said, stops right here, right? The moment I stop saying, my sound stops. But the substance remains in the air. Do you know that? And it's going to accomplish its purpose. The Word of God has much greater power than that. And that's why um, so many people, their lives were changed, their attitudes, and not only that their health conditions changed, as they heard the word in some way, like spoken word, written word, in some way, they heard it, and the word changed them. There's life in the word. I know it sounds all abstract, but I'm, I'm telling you from my personal experience and the experiences of many other people who have, the, who have gone the path before, and the word of uh, God has power. He spoke the world into being. being. He um, created everything, including you and me, with his word. Well, human beings, it's a little bit different, right? He gathered the, the dirt. He, he breathed into them. But whatever God says comes true. And um, especially the word of God has power. Uh, literally has power. It's not uh, imaginary power. It's not mental power. It's actual power. And um, God brings life to dead situations. God brings hope to those who are hopeless. Um, and, and once again, this is real, very practical. And um, you can experience it once you allow yourself to experience that. And then you'll be able to testify. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, read it the first time and you're going to just allow that, you know, the, the word just wash over you, just to uh, cover your being. And uh, number two, uh, when, when I read it the second time, um, you're going to pay attention to anything or word or image, smell, touch, uh, you know, um, sound, uh, taste that stands out to you. It could be a phrase, it could be a sentence, it could be some kind of just feeling, right? So pay attention to that and take it as yours. Uh, the third time I read it, you lift it up to God who's living. And, and there are those of you like 
we're supposed to learn English in this class and we're talking about connecting with God and uh, letting him speak to you. Um, this is kind of strange. Well, we're a Christian school for sure, right? And at the beginning of each, my, each of my class, um, I start with devotion. I start with um, word, the word of God in some way, in some form. And um, that um, people have turned, told me, my, my former students have told me that it, it's always a blessing. They get either, a, at least, at the least, they get life lessons out of it. Um, other people say that oh, it's really renewing my soul. Other people say, oh, you know what? I feel like God is speaking to me. So different responses, but uh, so far I haven't gotten the feedback saying, you know what, let's waste of time. Let's get, it, get into uh, learning the English language. So I, I haven't heard that from my previous classes. And so um, I hope it's a blessing to you as well. I do this not for myself, but for you. I hope you understand that. And... Um, because it's transformative, because it refreshes our soul, it changes our perspectives. It's good for you, it's good for me. Um, so the third time, you lift it up and ask God, who is living, who is hearing, who, who knows the, the very number of your hair at this moment, as it's falling out and you know growing, God knows. He cares so much about you. And so ask him, what does this mean? What do you want me to understand? And then the fourth time I read it, you just rest in God. Um, lift up all your experiences and the, and something that you did not experience, that you had wished experience. Um, lift it up to God, surrender to Him, and just um, rest in His presence. So uh, we're going to try that. So let's inhale, count to six. Once again, lower your shoulders. And you, you consider yourself as a balloon. And don't force yourself, just uh, but just deep breathing. Inhale, count to six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Exhale, one. Two, three, four, five, six. Inhale, one, two, three, four, five, six. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six. We inhale. God's love, His hope, peace, compassion, healing, restoration, reconciliation, creativity, goodness, faithfulness, His brilliance and excellence, His life. We exhale darkness, frustration, fears, shame, lack of confidence, failures, hopelessness, negativity, um, dull mind and spirit, um, unforgiveness, violence, anger, pride, Lust. We inhale. God's goodness, hope, holiness, purity, mercy, patience, healing, restoration, goodness, light, creativity. We exhale our sinfulness, dark thoughts. Uh, pessimism, um, 
anything that, that is keeping us from coming close to them. Uh, pride, uh, restlessness, um, self-righteousness, sadness, Anything that, that keeps us from going to God. Inhale. Four, five, six. Exhale. One, two, three, four, five, six. While you're closing your eyes, let me ask you this question, and you can ask yourself. Inhale. What are you feeling inside? Exhale. Certain words that describe your feeling tired, rejuvenated, frustrated, hopeful. Busy, peaceful, thankful, disappointed. Inhale. What do you bring to God today? To this session. What kinds of questions do you have? What kinds of concerns do you have? Exhale. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Do you feel the tension in your body? Just relax. Inhale. Got steadiness. Where were you looking for God in this past week? Exhale. Where were you? Where did you find God? Or His will, His hand, perhaps His shadow. Inhale. What do you need to let go of in order for you to completely be present during this time of meeting God? So, would you surrender that to God? Inhale. We come with an open heart. Have him speak to us through the Holy Spirit. Exhale. While you're deep breathing, I'm going to read the passage for you. The first time, let the word of God wash over you. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. 
and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was going to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. As I read it for the second time, just pay attention to any word or phrase, image, sound, texture, taste, smell, and emotions not stand out. You can take it as your own. In the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. As I read it for the third time, fourth time, um, a third time, you're going to actually um, lift up that image, word, sound, texture, feeling to God and ask him what it means, why he gave it to you. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. A virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his, at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, 
and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she, who is said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. As I read it for the fourth time, you can look up your experience to God or the experience that you have, wish that you did um, had, uh, that did not happen. Um, we lift it all up to God and because it's not bound by time and space, He may speak to you perhaps uh, later, even a few days later. So you can just um, enter into this peace. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to the Galilean village of Nazareth to a virgin engaged to be married to a man descended from David. His name was Joseph and the virgin's name, Mary. Upon entering, Gabriel greeted her, good morning. You're beautiful with God's beauty. Beautiful inside and out. God be with you. She was thoroughly shaken, wondering what was behind a greeting like that. But the angel assured her, Mary, you have nothing to fear. God has a surprise for you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son and call his name Jesus. He will be great. Be called Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will rule Jacob's house forever. No end ever to his kingdom. Mary said to the angel, But how? I've never slept with a man. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest hover over you. Therefore, the child you bring to birth will be called Holy Son of God. And did you know that your cousin Elizabeth conceived a son, old as she is? Everyone called her barren, but here she is six months pregnant. Nothing you see is impossible with God. And Mary said, Yes, I say it all now. I am the Lord's maid, ready to serve. Let it be with me, just as you said, say. Then the angel left her.
So, um, we just meditate on the Word of God. That's just one way out of me. And um, I really enjoy it still. Um, I wonder if you ever experienced was slightly different than the first time. Uh, we're getting used to this, right? Um, uh, whenever I do this, I am blessed in a different way. Uh, the Word of God uh, remains the same, but my response, my experience is always different. Um, it's incredible. It's renewing, refreshing. Um, it, it breaks me and moves me, changes me. Um, the Word of God is active and alive. The word that stood out to me, the, the phrase, uh, you who are highly favored. And uh, how Mary responded, like, well, what kind of greeting is this? And that stood out to me. I see uh, a little girl. Uh, I'm not a little girl, but you know, I, I see myself like um, a little girl who is, um, is just wondering, like, this, what is this? Um, uh, I don't know what you're doing. I, I've, been, I've been just doing the same thing, uh, just worshiping you, just Mary. I can see she is a worshiper, and even later, we can see her uh, song out of her joy, uh, magnificent. Yet, you know, um, when she sings that, I, I know that she is a worshiper like David, and. Um, I, this is just an, another ordinary day, but it was extraordinary because God chose to visit her by his angel. And um, of course, Mary must have been faithful, uh, but the only thing that God uh, wanted to see was her response. And she was fit for that, just like Peter was, Apostle Peter, or, or the disciple Peter. Um, all God wanted, uh, he did not want any of, and there was no prerequisite, there was no requirement, no education needed, no, no um, wealth or um, prestige or position, uh, family heritage, um, nothing. All he wanted to see was his response, yes sir, yes you are. And by that, he says, you who are highly favored. Um, Mary was ready with her faith. Um, all God wants to see is faith. I was seeing a vision, you know, like a you know, just sitting at the Lord's feet, treating the angel, the snake, as an ambassador, uh, representing it. It might have been the son of man. We don't know. <laughs> like the angel of God. Oh, actually, it was Gabriel. Sorry, it was Gabriel who showed up. So treating him like God, an ambassador. She was just kneeling down, receiving that call by a very uh, surprise. It caught her by surprise. I wonder what, what stood out to you. Did you see anything? Did you? And, and some of you might be wondering, in my church, we don't practice that. Like, what are you doing <laughs> with the Word of God? Um, yeah. Different traditions have different, uh, different um, faith traditions have different approaches to the Word of God, right? And I, I, I said that this is just one of the many ways. Uh, this doesn't have to be it. Right? This is one of the many ways that God can speak to us. And uh, believe it or not, God can speak to us through anything. Uh, but if we're centered around the Word of God, uh, the chances are that, that you're going to actually do it right. Um, even if that it's uh, and, um, making it much, much more than the Word of God, like spoken Word of God or written Word of God, we're, we're just making it really uh, rich by utilizing our five senses of the Spirit, right? 
and um, you can do that as long as you're centered around the word of God. Um, and if you have other kind of experiences, sometimes you have dreams and visions or, um, you know, somebody speaks word over you and things like that. How do you discern, right? How do you discern? You go back to the word of God. If your experience, your spiritual experience, it can be anything. I'm open to any experiences, but if those experiences somehow does not match with, don't match with uh, God's character, uh, his way of working, his principles, his word, if it's against or if it's outside, then that's not from God. <laughs> that's from some other source that you cannot trust. It could be your own thought, it could be the enemy, it could be the media or whatever the sources are. Um, only if you experience something, something extraordinary, something that you don't experience like day to day, like, you know, uh, with your physical body, with your physical abilities, that you experience something spiritual, but it does not go with the Word of God um, and the principles, his character that are written in the Word of God, um, then uh, you cannot trust it. But if it does, you can. So I want to do a little more today. Uh, I, I I am kind of letting you um, understand like one of the ways to meditate on the Word of God. Because you know, frequently students ask me like, how do you meditate on the Word of God? Right? Um, and there are five finger approaches. You know, like um, you know, uh, there are different approaches. Uh, there's something called quiet time, you know, <laughs> even if it's not quiet, right? Um, there are many, many different ways to approach the Word of God. You can do a Bible study, uh, you can do memorization, murmurization. Um, you can murmur throughout the whole day, murmurization. Um, so, but um, I tend to work, uh, just try to go over certain chapters, and next week probably I'm gonna, next session, I'm gonna try to do that, but this session, um, I just want to start with 1 Samuel chapter 9 um, and just explain to you what it means, right? Uh, I'm assuming that many of you don't have a biblical theological background and let's just take it easy. Okay, so uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, there was a Benjamite. All right, Benjamite, what, what in the world is a Benjamite? Okay, so um, there are, so Abraham. Abraham was a foreigner, uh, according to uh, according to the Israelites' perspective. Okay, so Hebrew perspective. Um, um, well, I can't even say Hebrew. Am I supposed to explain this? Okay, so because this is before Moses. Okay, so there was a there was a random guy. Okay, a random guy is a right. For God, <laughs> and believe it or not, although his job was to make carved images, uh, in him there was a search for God. That's what God saw. Another thing, he was likely to say yes 
who was an old man who was 75. 75, guys. Um, his profile, okay. How old are you 75 years old uh, making idols? Making idols. He had a family that has a beautiful, most stunning beauty in the entire human history. Like there are uh, about four women you can count, and she was one of them. Sarah. Initially, his name was Abraham, but later he was given sound by God, meaning God is with you. Okay, Sarah becomes Sarah. Sarah, Sarah later. Once again, sound okay, from the fact that God is with her now. Now she was God's, right? Um, making idols. What else? Uh, he had many servants, camels, livestock. And he, by the way, had a, a nephew called Lot. And Lot's wife. Um, he had other other people too. Um, that's not the only person. So anyway, um, and uh, he had, had a, a servant, faithful servant. Anyway, Lot calls him when he turns seventy-five. His way of working is beyond our imagination, right? And so um, he says, Yes, sir. Because there was something that he could feel in God's voice. There was something in, in, in that voice that really uh, that was compelling. That he could trust. Otherwise, can you imagine packing up yourself like 75 at, at the age of 75 and you have your wife? Um, no child, but you have like servants, livestock, and you are having a comfortable life. And what made him back up and leave? He went to a country, region that he was not aware of. There was no map, no GPS, no whatsoever. And um, there was something in his, in his voice that Abraham recognized. Maybe he was kind of spiritual, although he was idol worshiping. And he said, yes, sir. And he somehow persuaded all his people and left. And day by day, God led him by his spirit. I want to talk about the entire story. But the only point that I want to make is God promised him. He entered into a covenant relationship with God, which is incredible, which is mind-blowing, which is another topic that I'm going to talk about another time. But uh, he entered into a covenant relationship with God. And what God promised to Abraham, something that he never deserved, something that he was not expecting. Um, Abraham, I love you. I'm going to bless you. You're going to be a blessing. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless those people who bless you. I'm going to curse those who cur cur curse you. And I'm going to make you a blessing. You're going to have many, many descendants, as many as the stars in the sky and the grains of sand. And Abraham's like, Am I being delirious, Lord? Speak one more time. <laughs> he didn't say that, but anyway, God, God um, said that. And that faithful God is going to carry out that miracle. Um, by the way, long story short, he has one son, one son by faith. He, he had another son by mistake, which becomes a, a trouble for the descendants <laughs> and even, even till now. But, um, Yes, one son by faith. And there's another another story of, you know, dedicating him right, or, or sacrificing him. Uh, trusting that God is going to give him back to him. But anyway, through that one son called Isaac comes Alright, Abraham. And then this guy is called Isaac. And then Isaac has two sons. Okay. 
Okay. One is um, the third, first son's name is um, Esau. The second second son's name is Jacob. Uh, he has another name given by God. When God sees a, a person is transformed and now finally like they became devoted to God, like he he can rename them. And Israel, you have wrestled with me and have overcome. What do you mean by that? Uh, another topic, but his other name is Israel. So Jacob had 12 sons. So, uh, I'm missing two sons. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, like Reuben, like uh, Simeon, you know, everyone. So I'm not going to name all of them, because we're Simeon, like Judah, you know, like uh, Issachar, uh, everyone. So so um, the last one was Benjamin. Okay, Benjamin. So the last one. And uh, God has promised to Abraham that he's going to give him the descendants as many as the stars in the sky and as many as grains in the, of the sand. But uh, he had 12 sons. All these sons had countless number of uh, children and grandchildren you know, after that. So there's like an um, exponential growth in terms of the number of people. And so they did become as many as the stars in the sky um, and grains of sand. So now, um, because Benjamin had many sons, had, had sons, and he, he his sons had grandchildren, his descendants were, were numerous. Um, this group of people are called Benjamites. 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 Yeah. You know, Levi, there was a son named Levi, and um, his, his, he and his descendants are called Levites, right? And so uh, Benjamite, there was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abel, the son of Zerah, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphia of Benjamin. Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel. And he was a head taller than anyone else. So uh, the Bible oftentimes uh, record, well, always record the most important facts uh, because it cannot contain every single detail, right? There's, it's impossible. Even with the uh, minimum details, we have this whole book. So um, something to mention in the Bible is pretty important. <laughs> so, what was his character? Like, what, how was it described? And handsome, a young man, as he could uh, could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was head taller than anyone else. So he, unlike David, right? He he would he was a man of stature, and uh, there was he looked to some degree, uh, you know, he, he seems to look like a leader, right? But that's not why God chose him. Uh, it describes that because that stood out to people. But there's a reason God chose him as the king. We're going to talk about that later. Now the donkeys belonged to Saul's father, Kish, were lost. And Kish said to his son, Saul, take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and through the area around um, Shalisha, but they did not find them. They went on into the district of Shalim, but the donkeys were not there. Then he passed through the territory of Benjamin, but they did not find them. When they reached the district of Zuf, Saul said to the servant who was with him, Come, let's go back, or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us. But the servant replied, Look, in this town, there is a man of God. He is highly respected, and everything he says comes true. Let's go there now. Perhaps he will tell us what way to take. Saul said to his servant, If we go... What can we give the man? So like, you know, in the past, and, and probably uh, it's true even today, right? If you go visit somebody, and especially if someone, uh, if that's someone who's important, you tend to bring a gift, 
right? Uh, it doesn't have to be like way expensive, but you, you bring something good, right? And this is a man of God who um, is a prophet, and so they're supposed to bring something, right? So if we go, we can give the man the food in our sacks is gone. We have no gift to take to the man of God with. What do we have? The servant answered him again, Look, he said, I have a quarter of shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God so that he will tell us what way to take. Formerly in Israel, if someone went to inquire of God, they would say, Come, let us go to the seer. Because the prophet of today used to be called a seer. Good. Saul said to his servant, Come, let's go. So they set out for the town where the man of God was. As they were going up the hill to the town, they met some young women coming out to draw water, and they asked them, Is a seer here? He is, they answered. He's a man of you. Hurry now. Let's just come to our town today, for the people have a sacrifice at a high place. As soon as you enter the town, you'll find them before he goes up to the high place to eat. The people will not begin eating until he comes, because he must place a sacrifice afterward and those who are invited to eat. Go up now, you should find him about this time. They went up to the, up to the town, and as they were entering, there was a, a Samuel coming toward them on his way up to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel, about this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him, ruler over my people Israel. He will deliver them from the hands of the Philistines. I have looked on my people, for their cry has reached me. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, This is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, Would you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer. Samuel replied, Go up ahead of me to the high place, for today you are to eat with me, and in the morning I will send you on your way, and I will tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, do not worry about them. They have been found. And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and your whole family? Line. It's very interesting. Um, I didn't want to interject, but this is kind of interesting that um, God utilizes um, our little concerns. Uh, perhaps that's, that's our daily issue, like, you know, the, uh, the uh, issues that we encounter in our daily life, right? Um, but somehow, uh, even through that, you know, God uses that as a, as a channel through which he speaks, he, through which he, he gets his work done. Now, uh, they lost donkey and they, they're searching, and that's why they found this seer. What a divine appointment. Um, well, uh, at the same time, the seer, Samuel, have been given instruction from God to anoint this guy, Saul. And so, like, Saul has no idea. Like, he went out to look for his father's donkeys. And uh, something extraordinary happened to his ordinary day, right? Saul answered, but I'm not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel, and it's not my clan, the least of the of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin. Why do you say such a thing to me? See, I'm am I not a Benjamite? Because Benjamin is the last son. Am I not the last uh, least of the tribes? And it's not my clan, the least of all the clans of the tribes of Benjamin. Even among the Benjamites, like my family is the least. God told you to anoint me? Like, whoa, well, whoa, well, whoa. Well. I mean, I, I don't understand this. This is part of the reason God chose him. Because uh, he knew how small he was. He knew uh, who he was before God. Very unfortunate he couldn't uh, maintain this um, mindset and perspective later on. But this is one of the primary reasons God chose him, that Samuel brought Saul and his servants into the hall and seated them at the head of those who were invited, about 30 in number. Samuel said to the cook, bring the piece of meat I gave you, the one I told you to lay aside. So the cook took up the thigh with what was on it and set it in front of Saul. 
Samuel said, Here is what has been kept for you. Eat, because it was set aside for you for this occasion. From the time I said, I have invited guests. And Saul dined with Samuel that day. After they came down from the high place to the town, Samuel talked with Saul on the roof of his house. They rose about daybreak, and Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Get ready, and I will send you on your way. When Saul got ready, he and Samuel went outside together. As they were going down to the edge of his town, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And the servant did so. You stay here for a while, so that I may give you a message from God. So, um, I'm going to read um, chapter 10 for you as well, because I think it's um, then it's going to make better sense later on uh, when I talk about my, um, the, yeah, the, hmm. Um, when, when I give you the message later, then it's going to make better sense to you. So, chapter 10. Then Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it on Saul's neck and kissed him. So, kissing um, in this culture context, it's brother to brother, and this is um, it's, uh, expressing uh, respect, uh, loyalty. Um, of course, intimacy, but it, you know, um, it, it's not that um, that uh, that kind of relationship that we imagine in California. No, um, this is a brotherly, holy relationship. Saying, "Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over His inheritance?" Because Samuel sees uh, Saul, who is called and who is favored, who is selected. For whatever reason, right? And uh, because he, uh, Samuel, as a prophet, inherits God's heart. Uh, a prophet does two things, right? Uh, foretelling and forthtelling. Foretelling is um, is uh, letting people know what is going to happen in the future. Forthtelling is what God wants to speak to them right now, right? So um, be God's ambassador. His mouthpiece. And um, Saul sees, um, Samuel sees Saul and um, he loves him because um, they're, they're meeting for the first time. Why does he love him so much? Um, it's because God chose him. He, God's spirit is on him. And Samuel's heart is pounding right now. Wow, men of God, you know, I bless you. And I love you. Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? When you leave me today, you will meet two men near Rachel's tomb. And Zalza on the border of Benjamin, they will say to you, The donkeys you set out to look for have been found, and now your father has stopped thinking about them and is worried about you. He's asking, What shall I do about my son? Then you will go on from there until you reach the great tree of Tabor. Three men going up to worship God at Bethel will meet you there. One would be carrying three young goats, another three loaves of bread, and another a skin of wine. They will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from them. After that, you will go to uh, Gibeah of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyres, timbrels, pipes, and harps being played before them. They will prophesy. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. So, um, see how Hoshan he is. He certainly says, like, I'm the least, like, my tribe is the least, my family is the least of the least, and I am like nobody. Why are you saying these things to me? The Spirit of God will fall upon you, and you will be changed into a different person. And you will strike against the Philistines. You're going to save the Israelites from the hands of the Philistines. 
Go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, but you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart, and all these signs were fulfilled that day when he and his servants uh, arrived at Gideon, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? So there's a saying, right? There, there's a uh, famous saying that originated from this occasion. Uh, the man who lived there answered, And who is their father? So it became a saying, Is Saul also among the prophets? After Saul stopped prophesying, he went to the high place. Now Saul's uncle asked him and his servant where had they been. Looking for the donkeys, he said. But when we saw that there was there were not to be found, we went to Samuel. Saul's uncle said, Can tell me what Samuel said to you? Saul replied, He assured us that the donkeys had been found, but he did not tell it, tell his uncle what Samuel um, had said about the kingship. So he is prudent. His like when when God gives you a vision, dreams. You don't usually talk about it, and you don't talk about it to like random people, right? Um, you need to cherish it. You need to keep it in your heart. Samuel summoned and the people of Israel to the Lord of Mizpah and said to them, "This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says: I brought Israel up out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God, who lives, who saves you out of your disasters and calamities, calamities." And you have said, No appointed king over us. So now present yourselves before God, before the Lord by your tribes and clans. So, um, so much for that. Um, he was, he was, uh, he knew who he was before God. He, he knew how small he was, how incapable he was. Only by the power of God he was going to do mighty work. And probably that's why God chose him. After he was empowered by God, he started prophesying, and people started to be drawn to him. And when God's favor is upon this person, that people are drawn to you, right? But then, uh, very unfortunately, he forgets that God is the one who established him as a king. And he starts to realize, like, oh, oh look at all these people, like, how cool I am. Probably that's uh, the th kind of thought he reached. Um, his people made me a king. Like he, his view shifted. Oh, God made me a king to, oh, people made me a king. And that's why he became so afraid of people and later uh, makes a very bad choice um, against God, against God's command. And so uh, we're going to talk about that next next session, but um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background so that you'll have a better understanding next time. So um, let's talk about English. This is all English, right? Um, I hope you um, are picking up some words and sentences and expressions. Right, so as promised, uh, we're going to talk about present. Perfect. So we're moving on to chapter two. This is good because we covered a lot even during the first session, right? I hope it's not overwhelming to you. Present perfect. And if we have time, create present perfect progress or continuous. Um, we'll see. So adverb. Before we talk about present perfect, um, last time we talked about adjectives, right? Um, there were many students in the room. There were um, male students in the room. There were smart students in the room. There were um, 
athletic students in the room, you know, when we talked about different um, adjectives today, um, today we're going to talk about um, adverbs, Ad adverb, and um, hopefully you'll be able to utilize that actively in your conversations. Multiply says verbs. What's an adverb? What's an adverb? examples of adverbs. He bakes cakes every Sunday. Right, making me hungry again. Okay. Um, every Sunday. Every Sunday. So um, adverbs um, oftentimes reflects like the timing, you know, how fast, um, how severe, how weak, you know. We ran out uh, of their kind of bread mix. <laughs> oh, really fast, right? Um, so uh, these are adverbs. You can make more adverbs. So we talked about, yeah. So how about this? God is good. God is good. All the time. God is good all the time. This is adverb, right? Like how frequent? Like how much? How severe? How fast? Right. So, um, um, he was driving. Carefully. Oftentimes it, it has like a ly in the end, not at the end of the word, but uh, not not always. But let's drive in this car carefully, and obviously carefully modifies the verb drive drives right driving was driving. Um. Um, she was enjoying uh, the company. How much? Very much. Or you could say she was really enjoying the company. So these are examples of adverbs. So let's talk about some uh, before we go on to talk about like the grammar. Because you know, um, I don't want to like start with grammar because it can just you can lose your focus. So let's talk about the uh, sentences first, right? If you turn to So if you turn to uh, page 31, 10 ways to say thank you. It's, it's good to know, right? Um, how do you say thank you? Thanks. Thanks a lot. 
Thank you so much. Thanks a million. Um, thanks for your help. Thank you for helping me. I really appreciate it. I'm really grateful. That's so kind of you. I can't thank you enough. I owe you one. This means you want, uh, uh, you want to do a favor for the other person in the future, right? I owe you this one. Yeah. So um, I can't thank you enough. It's like for extremely important things. Right? You wouldn't say that like uh, when the other person actually like opened the door for you. I mean, it, it's a favor, and you would say thank you, but. I can't thank you enough. Like you, you wouldn't say that to, to um, like some um, light uh, help, but rather for uh, really important things. All right. And then, so it would, what if the other person says thanks a lot or thanks a million? Thank you for your help. Uh, I appreciate it. What are you gonna? How are you gonna respond? Right. You're welcome. No problem. No worries. Don't mention it. My pleasure. Some people say my pressure. Um, anytime. It was the least I could do. Yeah, just like kind of humbling yourself, right? It was the least I could do. Glad to help. Sure. Well, thank you. And so, you know, I, sometimes, you know, when, when two people think, are thinking each other too, right? Okay, how about Apologies. Oh, I'm sorry that da, 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 I, I was so rude yesterday. I'm sorry that um, I didn't pick up the phone, or I'm sorry that um, I couldn't make, make it there today, something like that. It was my fault. Um, I'm taking the responsibility for the problem. Yeah, it's my fault. Um, oops, sorry for small problems. Oh, I should I should have done this. I should have done that. Um, I should have called you and told you uh, told you that I couldn't come. Right? Um, I apologize for whatever. Um, I apologize for uh, the delay. I apologize for this is more formal and this is more intense than I am sorry. Right? Yeah. So then somebody said I'm sorry to you. Then what are you gonna do? Oh, um, that's okay. Um, it happens. Yeah. No problem. Um, don't worry about it. For serious offenses, I forgive you. Like so, use your common sense. Like some people are really offended. Like if you say I forgive you, like you know, they give you this look. They get even more mad, right? Um, so be careful how you use it. So um, present perfect. Present perfect. So I'm gonna just uh, show you in a diagram once again because then um, it makes better sense. present perfect so once again we always do this right now by this time now you're used to it this is present this is past and that's future so what happened is uh, so the form first of all Subject, subject, and then um, has or have, depending on uh, singular, plural, and then um, uh, perfect, uh, uh, present, participle. And then object, right? Subject, object. 
Okay, so then uh, verb plus what? ED. Present, uh, perfect, a present participle. So subject, has or have, verb, ED, and object. This is how uh, the present perfect looks like. So what we think, we'll do an example. What would be an example? Um, she has had dinner with her family. Yeah, so then um, the activity started in the past. We don't know exactly when it started in the past. And it has, that continues to the present. We don't know how long it's going to take, but uh, it's continuing. So examples, I've done my homework. She has had dinner with her family. I've already prepared breakfast. Uh, my sister has cleaned the room. It has rained a lot lately. She has watched this movie several times. So it's like, um, it's, um, so this is different than past uh, or present uh, pro progressive because it's not that it's going on right now, but so far that is the fact. So it, it started in the past. It started, okay, let me not confuse you. So it started in the past and it has continued so far. It has been true so far is what it means. So that's how, how it's different from uh, present continuous or present uh, progressive. So, it has rained a lot lately. She has watched this movie several times, like up to this time, like by this time, she has watched the movie. He has saved um, $20,000 up until now. So it is like, um, it started in the past, uh, and I'm talking about what is true, uh, fact, as of this point. They have gone fishing until later this evening. I've sold 20 questions so far. The, so, the, so there is no, like a, there is a chance that it's going to continue, but so far this is true. This is fact as of now. They have gone fishing until later this evening. I have sold, uh, solved uh, 20 questions so far. I have already made the coffee. They have already eaten your four plums. Or plums, guys. I have lived in Texas for ten years. Tom just uh, Tom has just come to the office, so he's he's in the office right now, right? Um, the students have read that poem twice. I have never lied in my life. I think that's a lie. Um, I have never been to Germany, so. In the future, I might visit Germany, but as of now, like so far, I have not. It is what it says. Fact as of now, uh, so far. Okay. And then uh, we want to know the negative forms, right? The negative forms. I have done my homework. I have not done my homework. Right, so you, you insert not between um, have and have, and then uh, verb ed in between. Right, I have not done my homework. She has not completed the assigned work. I have not seen Susan since Sunday. We have not received any mail since we were retired. I haven't met before. We haven't gone to watch the new movie. It hasn't stopped. So um, these are the negative forms. Like, how do you make a question out of that, right? Um, in that tense. Have you done your homework? Oh, 
this should be kind of annoying to you if you grow up hearing this. Um, my parents never talked about homework, but have you done your homework? Um, has she visited the children at the orphanage? Has the post come yet? Hasn't my mother cooked the dinner yet? Uh, have you ever been to England? Have you done the essay yet? So as of now, like as of now, is it there or is it not there, right? Present perfect tense uses, number one, uh, present perfect tense is used to express an action that happened at an unspecified time in the past. So we don't know when it happened, when it started. And the impact of the event is now continuing, the impact. Example, she has lost her wallet. She has lost her wallet. So, so far, it's in the state of being lost. So she can't find it, right? We can't reach Paul by phone. Have you seen him? So, uh, have you seen him? So far, we have not seen him. Tom isn't at school. I think he has gone to the theater. Um, this, is, this, this is actually nicer than um, there's some other stuff. So, so um, a friend of mine actually um, has a charity group, and she was frequenting to herself to uh, one of the police stations, local police stations, to rescue her group members. Uh, Tom isn't at school. I think he has gone to the theater. So as of now, he's not at school, right? My sister has broken her arm. Her arm is still broken. So, so far, it's broken. It's not healed, right? Uh, present perfect tense is used to express an action that ended recently. Uh, so that's another, so like, when do you use uh, present perfect? Um, number one, uh, the action has started in the unknown past, like unspecified past, and the effect, the impact of it, it is continuing till now. Uh, another situation where you use uh, present perfect is uh, when you want to express an action that ended recently. We often use words like just or recently for the events taking place a very short time before now. Um, I have just finished my project. My mother has just cleaned the house. We have recently eaten dinner. Yeah, I just finished my project. Yeah, so you would say that like so. Um, it, it just ended recently. Okay, so another situation where you use present perfect tense. Uh, present perfect tense is used to talk about unfinished actions or states or habits that started in the past and continue to the present. Unfinished actions. In such sentences, it's emphasized how long the action has continued. So we usually use since before to express how long we often use um, stative verbs or non-continuous verbs, missed verbs in such sentences. Okay, so what, what are some of the examples? The student has studied math for three months and it, it hasn't been finished yet, right? He, it started in the past, but it's in a continuous uh, state, right? It's still continuing. I have lived in Paris for five years. My son has been sick since Monday, and he's still sick, right? He has worked in Berlin since he graduated from the university. She, haven't been, she hasn't been calm since the accident. Well, the examples have uh, grammatical errors, right? She hasn't been calm since the accident. Teachers have fought this project, uh, with this subject for hours. They have had many cars since I can remember. So it's not finished yet, okay? So that's another situation. A fourth situation, uh, present perfect tense is used to express repeated actions, repeated actions in an unspecified time, specified time between the past and now. So we have watched that movie three times. I've seen David several times. Chef had uh, six exams so far this semester. They have called him four times this month. 
So multiple actions, repeated actions at different times, right? Okay, the fifth occasion, present perfect tense is used when we talk about life experiences. So like, uh, I've done it before, right? So I have been to England in my life. Have you ever eaten sushi before? We have never tried to invent something new. Okay, the sixth occasion, um, many occasions, right? Uh, present perfect tense is used when we talk about accomplishments. My father has spoken five languages. Right? Accomplishments, right? Scientists have found a new way to get cancer cells to self-destruct. Uh, man has walked the moon. Yeah. And then the seventh uh, situation where you can utilize uh, uh, present perfect is when we talk about changes that has occurred over a period of time. Over a period of time. So our English has improved a lot when we moved to England. Her behavior and attitudes have changed a lot since you last saw her. I have become more interested in medical issues. Yeah, so changes over time. Um, so how do you recognize present perfect tense? Well, of course, like had and have, you know, um, that'll give you a hint. But uh, just recently, lately, already, before, not, the that yet, never, ever, since, for, so far, until now, up to now. Exercise of present perfect tense. I studied, so, um, I've studied English for the past 10 years, right? So um, it's, um, uh, it's it started in the past, unspecified time in, in the past, but it's continuing now, right? Um, I've studied English for 10 years. They have known each other for seven years. Okay. It's not finished yet. Like we, we're continuing to know each other, right? They're getting to. Um, I've been sleeping for 30 minutes now. Well, so this person is talking while I'm still sleeping, right? Um, how long have you, how long you, you have learned Chinese? I have learned it since 2021. Okay. Um, he has bought that car for 10 months. I've, I've slept for a long time. We have lived here since 2019. He already has read the book for four months. Yeah. So, let's learn some new sentences. Um, th this has nothing to do with the tense that we're learning, but just uh, uh, more sentences. I'm learning English. I don't understand. Could you repeat that, please? Just please, uh, could you please talk slower? Thank you, and that helps a lot. What does that mean? What does mm, mean, right? How do you spell them? Spell it. What do you mean? Okay. And then there's something called um, present perfect progressive, um, which I'm not sure if you have time for. So next time we're going to talk about present perfect progressive, but for now, um, I'm going to turn to more sentences, if we can actually um, practice, yeah. Um, Yeah, so if you actually take a look at um, 30, um, 39, there are some more uh, phrases, right? 10 phrases for introductions. I just want to introduce myself. I am um, Sophia. I think we've met before. My name is 
Tara. My name is um, Jim. Um, uh, hello, um, this is uh, Miss Yoon speaking. Right. Um, I'd like to. I'd like you to meet Mrs. Smith. Okay. Um, have you met? Have you met Peter before? Um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, this this young lady. Okay. Uh, nice to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Likewise, you notice how you respond. Likewise. Um, this is uh, one of the ways to like uh, several ways to introduce yourself or um, introduce each other. Uh, six ways to show interest. Okay, so like when somebody's talking about something, then how do you respond, right? Really? Okay. Not so interesting. Um, it depends on like, uh, the other person can actually take this several ways. Not so interesting and you you know, the other person might feel uh, you, this person is really interested, but otherwise, that's interesting. It's like, um, you know what? I'd prefer a different topic. You know, sometimes people say, that's interesting, you know? <laughs> um, so it, it, it depends on the, um, situation so aha uh aha -huh. uh -huh. right gotcha gotcha uh, sure but uh, all these words like it um, it's important for us to remember that um, our body language uh, gestures facial expressions you know nonverbal languages actually speak 80% uh, of the content like uh, uh, how we understand the other person is 80% um, by nonverbal, so uh, it's up to how you say it. Yeah, and then there are no noise, noises, uh, meaning not the outside noise, but rather like noise going on in your mind um, by your personal experiences or like the experiences that you just had and things like that. So like, um, it just comes in your mind. So um, we oftentimes have a difficulty seeing the other person, the way it is, the way he is and she is, but rather like, different um, interpretations, like different noises, like our uh, prior experiences with certain kinds of people, you know, like that they all come together. And so sometimes we, we're not able to see uh, the other person the, the way he or she is. So we want to be aware and we can actually uh, work against it, uh, work in spite of it. Um, Five ways to end the conversation politely. It was nice chatting with you. Well, it's getting late. Uh, anyway, I should get go, uh, going. Sorry, but I'm afraid I need to go. I need to um, take this phone call. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I actually got to run. No, not that you're actually running, uh, but I, I got to go, I got to run. 10 English phrases for telephone calls. Hi, this is Jane. Jane Smith. Okay. Uh, may I speak with John Smith? Okay, there, there we go. Um, <laughs> is John there? Um, I'm calling about this matter and that matter. I'm returning you a call. One moment, please. You hear this uh, through automated messages, right? Um, hang on a sec. This is kind of informal. Okay. He's not here. Would you like to leave a message? Would you ask him to call me back? Thanks for calling. 10 phrases um, to, to, uh, to ask for information. Can, I, can you tell me this and that? Could you tell me this and that? I'd like to know about this and that. Do you know this and that? Do you have any idea about this? Could anyone call me, tell me? Use this phrase when asking a group of people. So like, if it's you and another person like this, uh, this just two of you, and then can somebody tell me this? Like it's going to be really funny, right? Unless uh, you're trying to make it, make a joke. Um, would you happen to? Okay, so uh, it would be funny if you if it's you, uh, the second person, and then there's a dog. Can anyone tell me? Uh, would you happen to know? I don't suppose you know. I was wondering. I'm calling to find out. Okay, um, so uh, do you know, do you have an idea, 
Would you happen to know? Um, I don't suppose you know. Uh, use these sentences if you're not sure if the other person has the information. I know this is a lot, but um, I hope it's helpful. Five phrases. Just say, I don't know, uh, for the beginners, right? And we're going to uh, get to more complex sentences later. I have no idea. I have no clue. I can't help you there. Yeah. Um, I'm not really sure. I've been wondering about that. I've been wondering that too. So like I'm, the, I'm in the same boat. Great. Um, and 10 phrases for asking for someone's opinion and giving your opinion. What do you think about this and that? Okay. Be careful when you see this. And when, especially when people start talking about politics. Um, how do you feel about this and that? What's your opinion of this and that? What are your views on this and that? So like, I oftentimes ask people for feedback for my projects, for my uh, videos or teaching in order to reflect that um, to, so that I can improve, right? Um, but um, if you use these sentences for like politics or <laughs> uh, perhaps even in, uh, talk about somebody that you don't like or it, it could be somebody that you like and the other person doesn't like. Um, be careful now where, where the conversation goes. Um, you can be opening a kind of worms, right? What's your opinion of this? What are your views on this? In my opinion, yeah, if the other person is interested in my opinion, if the other, I'd say, personally, I think, this is like being a little bit careful. Like, I'm not saying that this is how it is. Like, I'm saying, like, in my personal opinion, uh, if you ask me, the way I see it, the way I see it is this, from my point of view, yeah. So, and then um, another person actually asked you this question, like, what do you think about this? How do you feel about that? And you don't have an opinion. What do you say? Well, I've never given it much thought. I've never given it much thought. I don't have strong feelings either way. Well, it, it, it might be because you don't have an opinion, but um, it could be that uh, you're actually okay with both, right? It doesn't make any difference to me. I have an opinion on the matter. Whatever, like whatever, uh, be careful with this. <laughs> Once again, um, uh, if you are giving, uh, if you say this, some, sometimes it comes across to the other person as like having an attitude, like whatever, you know, there's like a, uh, one of the famous like teenage phrases, right? So uh, whatever, especially with, with shrugs, be careful. So um, use it with a uh, grain of salt and uh, use your common sense. But let's close with the prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the second session, Lord, um, just learning about grammar, um, adjective, uh, adverb, um, and uh, different conversational language. Father God, we ask you that you'll continue to teach us and continue to uh, help us just uh, actively engage in conversations with others, Lord, so we can practice. And um, Lord, um, uh, may you uh, give our students your wisdom and uh, especially understanding of your word, um, who you are, how you are like. Father, may you keep. Uh